try and multitask here using my voice to talk about one thing while my hands are setting something up. And it sort of is just said, different parts of your brain do different things and they interfere and stop other parts from working. This last year, since uh, I stopped doing computer work in January when uh, Intellisys kind of stopped paying people, um, what I do in the rest of my life is work with children and community and I have been doing outdoor stuff with a bunch of kids, survival skills, various things. And we took children at the family camp out at the end of, uh, the beginning of this year, in the fall for the, this outdoor class we run. And we took them through or set up a, a uh, what do we call a string walk, just a, a cord off through the woods, through all kinds of hazards, underneath trees, bushes, around things. And after, this is after dark, lead them up there blindfolded and put their hand on the string and say, we'll meet you at the other end. And they just have to go along that string um, following it and paying attention and uh, see if they can do it. The, ideally, they won't make much noise while they do it, too. But they do. And so they're going along there blindfolded, and they get to the end, and almost to the end, there's about a oh, about this much of a drop into a hole. There are leaves and stuff, but they slide over it and go, go through and around. The parents, meanwhile, that had seen us, the other teacher and I set this up, were aghast at what? You're sending them through something like that? You know, how can, they, how can you do that? They're going to not like it. It's going to be horrible. Well, it turns out the parents were wrong, and we were right. They loved it. Um... But then, after they went through, they was it, well, why did we have to have a blindfold on? Why, why couldn't we just go through? And Okay, try going through it without the blindfold. And they did. And they found it to be much harder without the blindfold on. The reason is that without the blindfold, they were trying to, let's see, and where is the, uh, the goodie to plug me in to the vid video? Oh, here, never mind. Without the blindfold, they were trying to use their eyes after dark to see everything. And they were ignoring Uh, is it that one? They were ignoring the other inputs, their, their ears, sort of body perception of noticing that there's a tree right next to you because of how it reflects the sound and the heat. And let's see, there's a setting here that I can see it on my screen too. Is that the one? Yes. So, with, by limiting their, their uh, eyesight, by limiting their uh, realization that they, they could not use their eyes, they had to use everything else, they did a better job of getting through this maze, following the string after dark. It's the same thing using language or whatever. We, we don't use all of our senses to the best of, of our abilities because we rely on one or two of them to the exclusion of the rest. 
So, yes? Is that because of bandwidth? Uh, I'm not sure. It, it's more focus. It's just limitation. If, if you're expecting to get all your input from your eyes, you're not paying attention to hearing as, and stuff as much unless you think about it, unless you have yourself do that. And the kids, obviously, haven't had any training in that and don't think about it. So they were, they were not doing so hot. So what I've got is an S40 sitting on a, and why are you not powered up? Because that, this thing has some weird USB ports. I can run the mouse off of this one. Uh, that's why, because I wasn't using a USB port. Yes. I've got an S40 board, and on it I've got um, E4th. I don't have E4th on the S40 board. I have E4th... Um, in a file that's going to be loaded onto the S40 board. Oh, I'm off the screen. No. Nope. I've got to do the same thing as... Um, Yeah, it's not it's not getting everything. Uh, what is it? Is it settings? And why isn't that one? That one should be 1024. That one should be fitting, right? I do not understand. That's got that. Why am I not getting this on screen? Did you apply that uh, new setting? I don't think you did. I did. I thought I did. So where is it? That's screwy. Yay. OK. Now it works because of where the screen wants to be. Don't need too much of this, so we'll. What e fourth is set up to do running on the S40, talked about it before, it uses just two nodes to implement some microcode to do the basic uh, twi about 30 opcodes, 34th opcodes, and all the rest are in high level list space, so it's not a fast system, um, but it does run compactly, and I get it started from Colorforth. Now what I like about the window, I actually like a different shape window for Colorforth. And that means getting this thing around there. I'd like to do it. This is going to look really weird.
to have both of them on the screen at the same time. And for my eyes at home, I've set up the uh, cursor to be a big one so that it's pretty obvious. Um, Two hundred load is enough to bring in the whole uh, Windows environment. And at what it's doing, besides loading the chip up with the code, it's also copying about 5K words of code into the, the RAM that's external, the, the SD RAM that's connected to this thing. And then it pops up into the IDE. And I don't actually have to use the IDE because then I go back to the terminal window. This is just to be in a terminal. And I hit the space bar. Oh, I haven't hit a TT yet to get me into the terminal. And then I hit the space bar and I'm in E4th. Bit threaded code, the, the two dates of the things. E fourth runs everything uh, in a an inner loop, and bit threaded code (BTC) means that one bit of the execution token differentiates between list ex, uh, execution tokens, high level words, or code words. Code words here are actually micro code words that are executed on the chip, and they are just addresses within those two nodes. Turns out there are 11, nodes 11 and 12. Those two nodes, any address in them can be the address of, of an execution token. Um, they are, there's some things that distinguish which ones, but because of the, the, C, the C18 here, G18, neighbor ports are addresses within that address space. You can have a subroutine which is actually a call to a neighbor port. Just that that neighbor better have something to send to you because when you call the neighbor port, you're going to go to sleep until the neighbor gives you something to execute. And what I've done to implement square root and other math things, just anything I want to try out, is I've created in e -fourth the word try. And let's see, I think... And so it here is just stack down, drop, and I think that's about it. It's a call to stack down, which is to the neighbor port. That's a, a, a label that I have for the neighbor port. And I'm not sure why I have the drop, or whether that's even part of it. The list routine that Bill has is pretty straightforward. And let me look at the no, it is in here. Okay. BPS test I want square root test. And I'm actually going to open it with notepad because I don't want to get the whole editor thing. So this set of test words starts out with some library words that are in e -fourth that have do loop, add do loop and stuff to e -fourth. And then some colors so we can do color stuff uh, under Swift Forth. And then these various words that I'm using to check out square root routine. 
and random numbers. Um, I haven't implemented the multiply. I'll show you the code for that in a minute. But it's zero try, and root is one try. Root takes a double number and returns a single result, a single square root, and the residual, n and r in, in root. Square root take, drops off the uh, residual. And then there's some testing words to run through sequences of them. So if I type in here, um, let's try a square. I'll just take uh, 123 uh, dupe. I think that's actually, yeah, SS is what I want to do. 123 SS, which is just dupe UM star call root, carriage return, and put out the two values, 123 um, SS. Oh, forgot something. I haven't loaded. This file uh, has to be loaded in. OK, now if I say 123 SS, I should get 0 one, and 123. It's done the, the UM star so that I've gotten a, a double number out of it, called root, and I've come back with a 0 residual and 123, just showing that the darn thing works. OK. That code is over here. Is that readable? It's not probably adequately readable. Let's make it, spread it back out. A little bit better? OK, so this um, is Chuck's latest stuff with the block number showing as a background. Uh, this is with the formatting, with the blue words. Uh, if I get out of the editor, S-E-E-B, C blue. There are the blue words. And that's what it looks like. Pardon? Ah. And doing it uh, uh, back again gets rid of them. Now, my screen, yeah, that's about what I'm used to. The background, the block number doesn't show up so much at the magnification or whatever I'm showing here. It's pretty high. So this is the square root routine, the stack comment HL uh, double numbers in our world are, in, in the C18, G18 world, are backwards. It is much easier if the low order part is on the top of the stack. So we're not ANSI, it's just the low order is on the top of the stack, yeah? Uh, no, I, I've, we're, I do know what you're talking about, but everything's in words, you know, and these are multiple words, and the uh, Indianness of bytes and stuff doesn't really add into it. But bingo. And the my working on this all came about just because Chuck wanted to to check it out and. I'd done it, he, he emailed me or whatever, and I'd been working on the stuff at Novix all those years ago of getting it, the various things to work, uh, the multiply step and the divide step and the square root step and the um, CRC step and bit reversing step. All these things were in the Novix. It required a whole bunch of registers and now we're doing it in software, and I had to come up with um, what this was going to take. 
So the, the general algorithm for bitwise or, or digitwise square root is what you do by hand if you learned it. How many learned how to do it paper and pencil square root? Uh, people did that in base 10. And the trial divisor, it turns out to be uh, digit times two, or the previous thing, times two times the base. So in uh, base two, it is four times what you had before. It, it was pretty interesting how it all worked out. And you're shifting two bits at a time if you're doing it in base two um, to get, well, because you're, you're shifting in uh, base 10, you're shifting it two, two digits. You're shifting everything two digits. And what Chuck worked out with Novix is, it, oh, you could shift one of them to the right and one of them one bit to the left and use the hardware that's already there to shift it you know, one bit rather than having to put the hardware in to shift two bits. So what's happening here, I need a, a double two times. So the two star D is a little subroutine that is just what Jeff did. Of, of It's the same thing of filling in, um, but it's preserving the other the uh, high order, it fills in uh, a 1 or a 0 based on uh, the minus if just text the high order bit of the low word because I'm shifting left and that's going to shift in a 1 or a 0 into the high word and we'll always shift a 0 into the low word. So the root starts out it, and runs through does that pushes those two values on the return stack, uh, puts a zero there, brings back one, and then brings back a value, puts a value on there that in the Novix was the SR register. This is the trial divisor. The, the initial trial divisor, uh, well, it's, the, it, it's really the position counter. And Inside a, this loop, it was labeled because I've got a whole bunch of nesting of ifs and stuff and I didn't want to do the begin and, you know, working around with that. So I checked to see whether th this value has been totally shifted out or not, whether it's down to zero, and go through the loop. Creating first creating a, a trial divisor over two times over whatever, then uh, checking to see whether when I subtracted it, this plus down here, um, this is doing the the minus or invert plus is an over or a swap minus effectively. And then adding in the trial divisor thing from before. And now the first simplification or first shortening uh, optimization was instead of putting it back to its positive sense of looking at what the real number is, I'm testing the high order bit. And now if it's a, a one bit is set, I want to do what it's supposed to do if it's zero. And that saved me. I'm doing the inverting now and creating what the next uh, trial divisor is, XORing in the, the previous value of A that I used up here. Uh, pop, doop, da 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 da. That's just to get it around so that on the, uh, in the other sense, when it's a zero, when I don't have to do a subtract, when I shouldn't do a subtract, I don't have to do anything. I do an extra extraneous dupe over here just to put something on the stack so the stack balances and I can throw away this thing that I don't need anymore. Then I shift the, the double number back up. As I've pushed the low side uh, onto the return stack, that's 
happens up here and I get it out of the way and I'm working on just the high order. I'm only doing this trial divisors, tr subtracting 18 bits wide or 16 bits wide into the high part and then keep shifting bits from the low part into it while I'm shifting the bit position down. I'm shifting it right and I'm shifting the other, other one left goes through and jumps back to loop to do this until uh, this two slash is this value that's being um, shifted right. The two slash shifts it right, brings it back, and if it's completely gone, or if, it's, if there is still something there, it does it. If it's completely gone, it is done down here and it ends the uh, restricts the uh, residual to the right value and it returns. Um, it's funny, it, it seems really short to me when I first did it. Um, what is it, 8 and 16 and 12, so that's 20 words of code and Chuck's first thing was it looks like it's too long and we spent a day or half a day going over it and finally he, he seemed convinced that we couldn't really make it any shorter okay well this this gets the root routine this this does it but it doesn't have the interface to e fourth. this is this block or this load block is going to be compiled into node 2. Start 2 kind of alludes to that. But this is the, the boot. The, the origin is in 0. It sets up the B register and then jumps to this then. So it's just a skipping over this. That's only because in E4th it's just ever so much more convenient because I'm metacompiling the uh, co microcode word addresses and I'd love to have that just be a fixed address and I can forget about it and never have to worry, change it later on. But then the uh, the wrapper 252 load down here yeah what did I do? I got out didn't I? So this is the block that has the wrappers for the e fourth root and e fourth multiply. So try this is where it's going to jump to at boot time. So it's going to be sitting there and it grabs this literal, inline literal, and has stored it to the B register, which is the down port, which goes into node 12. So it's always sitting there. It's, it's gone to sleep, storing something into its port, waiting for e fourth to maybe never, but to call it with that try word. And what it sends over to be executed in node 12 is a store literal back to node 2, and then the, to call this pops word, which restores the e fourth stack cache. I just took something, the, the store p plus takes something off of the internal stack and puts it down. Then it checks to see, uh, it reads this fetch b, grabs what is being stored here and tests it. If it's non-zero, it falls through, does the root, if it's zero, it goes and does the multiply routine. Uh, look back at this thing, and root does a one try. So it is forcing, when this fetch B comes back a one, it falls through this one, and then this routine, pow. This routine is a bunch of stuff. These fetch p pluses are inline fetching the inline literals and sort of a 
uh, documentation thing is the comment ticks here are showing what code is actually being compiled and executed as a literal. So it's going to be compiled, it's going to be executed in the neighbor. The first thing that E4 root does is send over to node 12, give me the next two things off the top of the stack. Store P plus. Those are bringing the next two things into node 2. This fetch B got one of them. This fetch B got another one. It calls the root routine. And then it puts them back. Store uh, fetch P plus, fetch P plus. So it's having the node 12 read two values from node 2. And then finally it does a return so that it goes back to the E4th interpreter and says, I'm finally done with that try word you sent me a long time ago. And the code that it actually executes, the store B, pop store B, they're in the wrong order on the stack in node 2, and I want to reverse the order to go back because E4th wants the high on the top because it's an ANSI system. And the color fourth, the C18 stuff, has them in the other order. So it goes back and it jumps back to try, which goes to sleep waiting for the next time the E4 sends me a query. We can do this throughout the system. Uh, we've got two, four neighbor nodes. Each of those can have as many, using this multiple, you know, send a parameter to choose which one. This is the simplest one. Um, it could have been a jump table. There are all sorts of things that you can use to get these routines to have more than one routine in a node that e forth that can extend its microcode and do additional things in, if it's sitting at 11 and 12 on the S40, we've got 21 and 22 and 1 and 2. We've got four more nodes. That's that. 256 more words of code that can be microcode within e -forth. The initial 30 words that runs the kernel and the, the basic words takes up two nodes. We've got four more. We can do all kinds of stuff. Questions? Just, just one or two. Yeah, well... It'll go on to Chuck. Yeah, I'm, this is this is done. Bye. Bye. And yeah, take your video. Take your audio. Ready for audio, Chuck? Or who's coming up next? Chuck.